Well, I've now switched microphones. Um, hopefully anyone who's watching still, I wouldn't blame anyone to have <laughs> ducked off as a, to have uh, bolted by now, but hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, I'm not really sure what happened there. Um, I have had absolutely nothing but troubles with my AirPods lately. I'm taking them off because I don't need to hear. I can hear myself already. So there you go. Now we have <laughs> switched to a, a much better microphone, which I should have probably just been using from the beginning. So anyway, um, thank you for joining me. Um, I wanted to do a special episode this week, not with a guest. Well, not with a human guest, rather, but with this, which is the collaborative bottle that we've done with the guys, Joshua and Jason, the benevolent dictators of the single cask nation. Um, I wanted to talk, I have, as you can see, I've not opened my bottle yet. I tasted this whiskey when we selected this whiskey, when we decided to collaborate on a bottle a few months back. So I've tasted this already, but I haven't opened this, but I also wanted to, you know, uh, talk a little bit about why we chose this whiskey and why we're doing this. This bottle came, anyone who bought a bottle, which sold out insanely fast. And thank you all for that very much. Um, it came with access to the film for people who haven't seen it yet or want to see it again, and I hope you all will. But it also is going to be part of a roundtable discussion we're going to have about independent bottling. And if you've seen the film, you know that it plays a significant role in our storyline and about really the creation and advancement of single malt whiskey. Um, and some, there's now independent bottlers all over the world, not just in Scotland. The Single Cast Nation is based here in the U.S., and they do American whiskeys as well as Japanese whiskeys and, and other things, but they do a lot of single malt scotch whiskeys. So one of the things that we really wanted to do is have a conversation about the history of that, the meaning of that, the future of that, the current popularity of that, and, and how it's really become sort of a way of a having a curated relationship uh, with your whiskey collection where you don't, I may not know a certain distillery, but if I trust these people, then I'll trust that maybe this whiskey will be good. Now, this is from an unnamed distillery on Orkney. I'll let you guys sort that out yourselves called the Stones of Stinness. This is a 17 year old whiskey. Uh, I know that Joshua and Jason released uh, a younger sister cast to this a few years ago that remains one of their most popular whiskeys. Um, this is here. I will read you the, the data on this quick before I open it. Then I'll open it and I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do during this roundtable. So this is aged 17 years in a second fill Oloroso Sherry Butt, which is cask number 2398, which I'll also explain in a moment. Distilled November 2003, bottled May 2021, one of 360 bottles. It is 54.4% alcohol and it was made in collaboration with us. Uh, 20, cast 2398 uh, is a, a sort of a special number to us if you want to get into the deep weeds. If anyone wants to hazard a guess here in the chat, I'll say it, but um, I'm not going to wait too long because it's unlikely people are going to get it or um, guess it. But here we go. We're opening this. When I'm done opening this, I'll tell you what 2398 is. Here we go. Let's get the mic on this one. Ah, there we go. Here we go. Well, um, well, you know, the first thing I get on the nose is what I would best describe as Scotland in winter, at least um, parts of Scotland that are still heated by peat. Uh, but then there's this giant sherry bomb kind of punch. Mm, jelly beans, big red fruits, stewed fruits, Christmas cakes, caramel, sort of a a mulberry note, a blackberry note. I don't really know the difference between a mulberry and a blackberry. If someone does, you can put it in the in the chat, please, because <laughs> I've never really known the difference. Um, so 2398 is, we shot this film, as many films these days are, at 24 frames per second. What 24 frames per second is, is 23.98 frames per second. It's a frame rate. It's how many images are being recorded per second. And so when we were looking at casks and stuff, there was something about this cask. We loved the number of the cask already just because it's the, the film was shot at 2398. And actually I'm right now being recorded at 2398. So um, it's just a very cinematic look as opposed to 30 frames a second, which is much more sort of TV news kind of look. Um, but now back to this for a moment.
Mm. There's one of the things I'm really curious about is do independent bottlers develop over time their own flavor profiles? And there's certain things that I know that Joshua and Jason really like, and I have started sensing them coming through in all their whiskeys. So not all their whiskeys, but a lot of them anyway. And there is a really big, rich, sherry dance with wood in this that I absolutely love. Um, and uh, hmm, there's a, a breadiness on the nose of this that's very interesting, um, which I, I would not, I'd be reluctant to call yeast because it's too old for that. But um, I'm trying to add a couple of drops of water here. Uh, Alphonse, if you're watching, you'll be happy to know I'm using the, the films, Glen Cairn glass. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, so I'm very happy to say that I do have a date um, that we are going to be doing uh, the live round table with the people who got bottles on Sunday, August 15th. That is going to be at 9 p.m. UK time so that we can kind of straddle the world because our guests are going to be, some of our special guests are going to be in Scotland. Um, I, I am going to be, I'll still be on the East Coast as will Joshua and Jason. So, uh, but we want to include our, our California friends, especially because there are so many of them. Um, so you can set aside your, uh, some time on your calendar and hopefully set aside a dram of this for then. Um, the conversation then and now is going to be a little bit about independent bodily. And some of you who may have seen me and other things know that we've talked a lot that we're actually working on a second film all about independent bottling. Um, and that was really born out of kind of my interest in independent bottling and having an abundance of material that was really compelling, but just couldn't make it into the cut of the last film. So we're kind of re utilizing some of that footage and shooting a lot of new footage and, and making a, a new story about this unique thing, which no one, including a lot, including some of the world's most preeminent independent bottlers has ever been able to give me an analogy that of an, another industry that has something quite like it. Uh, I know that there are rum independent bottlers, but besides brown spirits, there's just nothing in the world that is quite like that. Um, the the um, uh, different aspects of the industry that have kind of grown out of it. Sure. Like there's uh, Johnny Walker was, uh, you know, a lot of them grew out of grocery stores and Johnny Walker was a grocer. And so a lot of the independent bottlers, um, Gordon McPhail is still a grocery store. Um, and they have created this niche market where when there was not branded whiskeys and the distilleries weren't selling their own brands, these guys were bottling them up and, and doing it. And I think that the, the, the bulk of that side of the industry has evolved over time where now it's much more of a curated experience where, everything from from very small boutique uh, independent bottlers to Gordon and McPhail or Cadenheads, they're doing a selection of casks that they put their name on as well in most cases as that of the distillery that made it. And I just find that absolutely fascinating. And I, I feel like they're the stewards of a lot of the history of whiskey. Uh, I mean, Gordon and McPhail's warehouse is, you know, this kind of uh, it's like the, the warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I have not seen it. I, admittedly, I've just heard about it. And, and, you know, that's decades and decades, if not centuries of casks. Um, and but they are also kind of at the cutting edge of what's new in whiskey in a lot of ways, where independent bottlers will, will take casks that maybe are great casks, but don't fit a Lafroig profile. They're just not what Kalila wanted or Linkwood wanted. So then they're kind of putting their own touch on it, sometimes just basically bottling them up, but sometimes putting finishes on them or, or continuing to mature them on their own. And I think that's really great um, because they can try things that distillery, big distillery groups with tens of thousands of units shift around the world would never be able to or willing to try. But a lot of the experimentation and the innovations come from them first. And I've always been fascinated by that. So now we're going to have a whole conversation with some of the most interesting and influential independent bottlers in Scotland and in the US. Everybody who has this bottle, this is a great example of it. This is a whiskey from a distillery. A lot of you have probably had whiskey from that distillery. You can compare it to it. And now that I've let it sit for a couple of minutes with the um, water on it, the caramel has come really kind of roaring to the front of this. And this it's this big, almost chewy lashings of caramel. I like, I like the word lashings. I noticed Billy Walker uses it in his notes all the time. Um, 
but then there's this kind of uh, almost like a Concord grape note, uh, that kind of pungent sort of skin grape, and still that breadiness. There's wood, then there's the, the the smoke, but the smoke on this is not. It's clearly not an Isla smoke. You know, it's it it's got a, a nice kind of heathery lightness to it. It's um, plays really well with this sherry, and it, this, this has been in a, a sherry cask for a long, long time. So, on that note, I'm going to go finish my dram, and I'm going to bid you all farewell. I don't see any questions coming through. I'm sorry about the sound issues at the beginning. I don't know what happened there, but I will try to sort that out. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, I'll see you all on Friday. Uh, this Friday, my guests on Big Man We Dream Live are going to be actually two of our own team, Brad Kenyon and Alphonse Palima, two of our producers who are also our camera team. And the three of us are all the Pennsylvanians involved. And what we're going to be doing is talking about next week is going to be our Pennsylvania premiere of the film in person in Lancaster, where we're, we are all either from or lived for quite a while. So uh, hopefully I'll see you here Friday. If you're nearby, hopefully I'll see you in Lancaster next week in person. But in the meantime, it's launch of a Mm-hmm.